It's been nearly a year since Russia invaded Ukraine. President Volodymyr Zelensky is now seeking more weapons and hoping to join the European Union. But what can EU membership offer? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. For the first time since Russia invaded Ukraine nearly a year ago, President Volodymyr Zelensky has been able to tour Europe. He's using the opportunity to thank European leaders for their support, but has also doubled down on his request for more military assistance. Zelensky is also seeking an expedited process to join the EU. He says Ukrainians are fighting on behalf of all Europe and has warned against an impending Russian offensive. We'll get to our guests in a moment, but first this update from our diplomatic editor James Bays in Brussels. On the third stage of his brief surprise European tour, after trips to London and Paris, President Zelensky flew with the French President Emmanuel Macron to Brussels. In the capital of the European Union, he was again repeating the same message. Thanks for all your help, but Ukraine still needs more. Slava Ukraine! He told a packed session of the European Parliament that Ukraine's home in the future is as part of Europe. We are moving closer to the European Union. Ukraine will be a member of the European Union. Ukraine that is winning will be a member of the European Union that is winning. After standing ovations in the Parliament, a short drive away, he was again greeted with applause by the leaders of all the EU's 27 nations. When he sat down with them, he laid out his specific requests. We need artillery guns, ammunition, modern tanks, long-range missiles, modern aircraft. At a news conference, President Zelensky wouldn't detail the responses he's received to his wish list, but he said the conversations have been constructive. He also stressed that time is critical, with a new Russian offensive expected in the coming weeks. James Bay's Al Jazeera, Brussels. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our guests in Kyiv. Serhiy Shapovalov is a political analyst at the Ilko Kucherev Democratic Initiatives Foundation. In Messina, Italy, Daniela Herrera, professor of international relations at the University of Catania. And in Washington, D.C., Samuel Green, director of the Democratic Resilience Program at the Center for European Policy Analysis. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Uh, Serhiy, let me start with you today. Uh, Russia launched a new wave of, of missiles uh, across Ukraine in the last several hours. Um, what's the current situation for you right now in Kyiv? The situation um, is okay. It is not the first wave of Russian missile attacks. Uh, they are trying to uh, target our um, energy infrastructure. Uh, so they aim uh, mainly civilian uh, population. They try to um, turn off the electricity for us. But as you can see, I am with you. I have internet and everything. Uh, so Russia fails another time uh, to harm our civilian population. And um, most of their rockets were intercepted. Our general staff reported that 61 out of 71 uh, cruise missile was shot down uh, this morning. And um, it is thanks to our air defense and thanks to our partners who provide Ukraine with advanced uh, air defense uh, systems. Um, maybe it was a nervous Russian reaction uh, to these uh, meetings of Zelensky mm. with EU leaders and British prime minister, but we are totally okay. Uh, all right, Sergei, let me turn now to um, the topic of that trip by uh, President Zelensky. How significant was the trip and how important was it that President Zelensky was able to meet face to face with all these EU leaders at the same time? Well, the main, uh, the main topic of uh, the Lanky, uh, Zelensky uh, meetings with both British Prime Minister and EU leaders uh, was to provide Ukraine with uh, the weapons that Ukraine needs to repel Russian aggression and to liberate Ukrainian territories. In particular, it was about F-16 uh, fighter jets 
which are complex and expensive weapons. Uh, these meetings are an important step in the negotiation process. And uh, without uh, these meetings, a political decision to provide Ukraine with fighter jets uh, cannot be made. Uh, similar negotiations have been uh, going on for a long time regarding other weapon systems. Uh, through diplomatic efforts, uh, Ukraine convinced its partners to expand military assistance and provide Ukraine with new and more powerful systems. It was about HIMARS systems, uh, Patriot air defense system, uh, Western, uh, Western tanks such as Leopard 2, Challenger 2, Abrams, etc. So, firstly, political decisions should be made to transfer these weapons to Ukraine. And these meetings uh, are important because in making such decisions, um, the emotional aspect and personal trust play an important role. Uh, and such meetings allow, allow for this uh, personal contact um, between and personal trust between European leaders and uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. Uh, Daniel, uh, if you remember... Uh, yeah. Sorry, Sergei, go ahead. Yeah, if you remember, Ukraine was uh, granted um, EU candidate status after uh, EU leaders, in particular Scholz and Macron, visited Ukraine, mm. uh, and they witnessed uh, the consequences of Russian war crimes. Mm. And this involved this um, emotional aspect. Mm. And it makes uh, such a decisions about uh, granting EU candidate status or providing Ukraine with weapons easier. So it, this is why it is important. Uh, Daniela, uh, you heard there uh, Serhi talking about the fact that President Zelensky is seeking more weapons, more weapon systems uh, from uh, EU leaders. Uh, President Zelensky also said at the conclusion of those meetings that several European leaders had expressed to him their readiness to supply Kyiv with fighter jets. I want to get your perspective on how likely you think that might be to happen. Uh, well, this is a very, very important and relevant meeting because for the first time President Zelensky had the chance to meet the, the European leaders. Please let me uh, remind that uh, there is a long uh, and established relation uh, between the EU and Ukraine. That um, so the Ukraine has been part of the European neighborhood policy, and also the EU has, tr has tried to play an important role uh, already in in 2014 and in 20. 17. Um, but so the, the Zelensky has also always looked at the EU and the European countries. But we also have to remind uh, and to remen remember that European countries uh, have different preferences when it comes to uh, foreign policy, bilateral relations, defense policies. Um, so this means that uh, uh, the uh, the president Zelensky was uh, looking at the EU, but he has also very relevant bilateral relations with some of the European countries. So mm. this can make the difference. Obviously, uh, meeting the EU as a whole uh, this time mm. uh, can be a symbolic different thing. Uh, but at the same time, because there's more formal legitimization, and it is clear that uh, yes, uh, uh, the president has prioritized those countries which have always supported more than others, Ukraine, mm. so obviously France and UK. But at the same time, we uh, have to remember uh, that different preferences and intergovernmental priorities may play a significant role in it. And Daniela, just to go back for a moment to the issue of uh, the fighter jets, because President Zelensky did say that, you know, private conversations he had with these leaders uh, at least led him to believe that they might be willing to send military aircraft or fighter jets to Ukraine going forward. Um, from your vantage point, do you think that is something that is more likely to be considered now by EU leaders than it was in the past? Uh, well, it's hard to say, hard to predict, because it's strictly connected to what they've just said, mm. that, uh, you know, different priorities European countries may have. In principle, as I was saying before, uh, this is more than a symbolic meeting. So uh, Zelensky could expect uh, more support, or more military support. But mm. uh, I have just heard uh, this morning, that at the end of the meeting, uh, uh, some uh, political leaders were a little bit cautious, like President Macron was a bit more cautious than in, uh, in yesterday, for example. So this may, we can say that in principle, it may uh, be likely to happen more than in the past because this meeting can make a difference. But at the same time, we always have to remember uh, that the intergovernmental dimension is a, is a, a strong constraint for European countries. 
Uh, so it's very hard to predict. Uh, Sam, uh, Russia has said that if countries were to send fighter jets to Ukraine, that that would have ramifications for the whole world. Uh, this is rhetoric that we've heard in the past uh, from President Putin and members of uh, his administration. But in this scenario, if that were to actually happen, if countries were to consider sending jets or were to actually send jets going forward, what would it mean when it comes to Russia and what would Russia be prepared to do? Well, the only person who really knows the answer to that question is Vladimir Putin, and his incentive, of course, is to keep us guessing uh, and to make us think, right, um, uh, to, that um, that we should be, in fact, deterring ourselves uh, from uh, from supporting Ukraine. Um, the reality is, we're now about a year into this war, um, and uh, Putin has tried, and and his his uh, spokespeople have tried at various points to draw uh, various red lines, any sort of military support, any sort of economic support for Ukraine um, was initially positioned as something that could lead to uh, 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 an expansion of the uh, of the war. Um, uh, any you know, provision of, of, of military support in terms of, of uh, anti-aircraft systems, uh, then in terms of artillery systems, and then in terms of, of tanks. And what we've seen is that at each stage, um, you know, Russia really has not uh, uh, you know, followed through uh, uh, with some of these threats, um, and we have seen again a Ukrainian military that that is uh, capable and resilient, a Ukrainian state uh, and a Ukrainian society that are capable uh, uh, and resilient, as well as a growing uh, uh, recognition uh, in in Western capitals uh, that um, you know this is not a war uh, that we can afford to allow um, uh, uh, Russia to win. It will create a world um, in which we don't really. Uh, want to live. And so while I think Daniela is right that there are differences of opinion about exactly how to achieve that victory uh, uh, for Ukraine, I think we're seeing uh, an increasing sense of confidence uh, uh, from Western leaders um, that they can uh, and should continue mm. uh, uh, to support uh, Ukraine in ways that will allow them to manage those risks. Um, but that also there's uh, uh, an opportunity here to shift uh, uh, the logic a bit, right? So the tanks um, that so he was mentioning uh, a moment ago, you know, will will show up on Ukrainian battlefields only uh, uh, in a matter of months. Mm. Uh, to be honest, it takes time to train people to to get things shipped, to get things uh, uh, positioned, to get the supply lines in place. The same will be true uh, uh, for uh, for fighter jets when uh, those are. Uh, eventually approved, and I do think it is a question of when rather than uh, rather than if. But what we've seen, particularly with the, the announcement from London, that uh, Britain would begin to train uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, air force pilots, mm. uh, what that does is it shortens the delivery time. Right? Mm. So uh, once we get to the point right uh, where uh, a political decision is made uh, to deliver these aircraft. Uh, they will be able to get into the fight much, much quicker. And mm. that doesn't just change the dynamic on the battlefield. That changes the calculations, obviously, for Zelensky. It means that he can afford uh, to keep taking the fight to Russia. Mm. But it changes the calculation for Russia uh, uh, as well. Putin has been hoping throughout this that he will eventually reach a point, that we will eventually reach a point at which Western capitals are no longer willing to provide uh, support for uh, for Ukraine. And what these meetings and these commitments continue to show him uh, is that that point uh, will not come until such time as Russia has lost this war. Sam, let me pick up on a point you were making and, and, and ask you something about it. Uh, you were talking about the logistics of all this. You were talking about supply lines. Um, you know, there are a lot of analysts that believe that Russia is on the verge of launching a new large-scale offensive in Ukraine, perhaps in the next few weeks. But one of the complicating factors here is the fact that when the ground begins to thaw, mud is going to be an obstacle. So are Russian troops actually in a position to advance at this stage? It's very hard to know, right? Um, we don't exactly know what they're planning, obviously. Uh, and, and I myself am not a military analyst, so I, I, I listen to the smart people on this. I think what the, the, the consensus among the smart people on this is, right, uh, is that uh, it's going to be a difficult couple of months. Um, uh, the Ukrainians themselves have been very clear about the fact that they are facing uh, a Russian military that has uh, increased its manpower uh, along the front lines, particularly in, in the east, um, that uh, does seem to be looking to make progress, not you know, a galloping progress across Ukraine, um, but uh, uh, to make 
you know, uh, 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 marginal gains. Um, uh, they are also willing to uh, take very significant losses in terms of manpower and equipment uh, in, in order to do that. Um, and uh, in an effort, I think, to exhaust Ukraine and, and, and exhaust uh, the West. So again, this communication that uh, uh, that Ukraine will not run out of support from the West, that uh, there is more uh, firepower coming to the front line, uh, that Ukraine will be able to withstand uh, this uh, renewed assault from Russia and will be in a position to, uh, to counterattack. Uh, is extremely important uh, mm. to the calculations on both sides. Daniela, obviously right now we're seeing a unified EU uh, that is bolstering its support to Ukraine. But if the war continues to grind on, if it essentially becomes a war of attrition, would at some point we see EU countries push to get Ukraine and Russia to the negotiating table? Uh, well, this is very hard as well, because the uh, EU has already uh, lived uh, at a crisis and uh, uh, already demonstrated uh, very little ability to, to uh, produce significant results on the diplomatic uh, scale. Um, for sure, uh, what it was, uh, it was told during the meeting is that uh, the, the fight uh, um, for, uh, for, uh, for Ukraine is also a fight for uh, the so-called EU values, so democracy, freedom, civilization, and, and so on. And this is what had been said today until, uh, until today, and it was basically a symbolic uh, support. Um, what will happen in, in the future? Uh, uh, let me remind what happened in 2017 and 2018 with the, the, the Minsk uh, agreement where the EU was, uh, was expected to play a major role and in the end it was very, very difficult and then the situation remained a, a little bit uh, uh, unbalanced for, uh, for a little while and then uh, <laughs> prolonged until today. Uh, so it is very hard for the EU to find a common position. This would be the basic condition to have a common position and until uh, until now we have seen that a common position is very difficult when it comes to weapon provision uh when it comes also to relations among states uh, as for energy dependencies of germany for example or other countries in uh, in the eastern part of europe have uh, um, different views uh, compared to other countries in the western part of europe um so what is missing is uh, uh, common ground on which all member states can uh, can act. So probably uh, we may expect some initiatives, some efforts on the part of probably uh, EU institutions, a commission, the commission, for example. But um, it is very hard to say that the mm. EU will play a decisive role, I would say, mm. uh, again. Uh, Serhi, if things get to a point, I know we're not at that stage right now, but if things were to get to a point where the EU or the U.S. or the EU and the U.S. were to try to apply pressure on President Zelensky to get him to the negotiating table uh, with Russia, when it comes to potential negotiations with Russia, where does public opinion in Ukraine stand on this? Uh... In December, um, a month ago, the organization that I re represent, Democratic Initiatives Foundation, uh, we conducted a, nation, a nationwide survey uh, that showed that 62% of Ukrainians uh, do not accept any compromises uh, with their occupiers. Another 18% of Ukrainians believe that some compromises can be made, but not all compromises. This means that it is uh, possible to negotiate on humanitarian issues, such as uh, return of uh, prisoners of, of war, uh, but um, not political compromises or territorial concessions. And only about 8% of Ukrainians are ready to make uh, wide compromises, including political ones. And uh, as we can see, the vast majority of Ukrainians uh, believe uh, they, um, Ukrainians understand that Russia intends to completely destroy our country and our people. Uh, the war crimes that they commit every day, shelling peaceful cities and killing civilians, executing uh, people in the occupied territories, these acts uh, can be clearly called genocide. Therefore, there is no room for compromise. Ukrainians want to be free people and Russia wants to kill us. 
Uh, we have nothing to negotiate about. We will continue our, uh, the fight for our freedom and liberate our territory from the occupiers. We have both determination and the resources to do so. And uh, about the behavior of our partners, I don't believe that they will start pushing Ukraine uh, for compromises. I think uh, that um, Macron and uh, German leaders who previously, in the previous years, maybe they believed that Putin is negotiable. Mm. But now they see that Putin is non-negotiable. Mm. And he continues this war uh, and there is no way other than to strengthen Ukraine and force Putin to stop this war. Maybe uh, these, uh, those negotiations um, about uh, tanks and public statements about tanks were, were such um, kind of signal or sign for Putin. Um, I'll try to ex explain my thoughts. Uh, for example, uh, Americans and uh, European leaders uh, say that we may provide Ukraine with tanks. And such a public statement is a sign for Putin that either you are stopping this war now or we provide Ukraine with everything needed to just expel you from the territory of Ukraine. You will be military de uh, defeated in military terms. Mm. Uh, Putin didn't accept this sign and uh, it means that he is non-negotiable. He doesn't perceive mm. such not direct communication, but communication with such public Sarah, statements. Sorry, I'm sorry. And, I'm sorry. Uh, that is why that is why the decision was made to give us tents. Sure, Sergei, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we are starting to run out of time. I just want to ask a few more questions uh, to Sam and Daniela. Uh, Sam, um, last month President Putin replaced his top commander in Ukraine yet again. That's the third time that's happened in less than a year. Uh, will the appointment of Valery Gerasimov make a difference, or is there any indication? that it could make a difference? Uh, I don't think it is. I mean, I think what we've seen since then has been a, uh, a doubling down uh, on the strategy uh, that so he was talking about right from the very beginning of this um, uh, of this conversation, right? Uh, and that we've seen since uh, September, October of last year, uh, when Russia started these waves of um, of, of bombardments uh, on Ukrainian civilians and civilian infrastructure designed to uh, to exhaust the country. It has failed uh, to do that. They have, um, you know, brought to fruition the plan for a partial mobilization, at least, that will put some, some more manpower, and they will test the front line. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, moving generals around and changing the chain of command does not give uh, uh, Russia new technology. It does not give Russia uh, new armaments. It doesn't really change the situation on the battlefield. It doesn't give Russia a new military uh, with which to fight or fundamentally a new strategy. The reality is that Russia has picked a war, picked a fight that it uh, uh, it can't really win. Um, and um, uh, and the initiative does really remain on the on the Western side. And there's 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 nothing that um, uh, that, that Putin really can do about that. Daniela, uh, in the past, um, in, in video streamed addresses uh, to EU meetings and to, to EU leaders, uh, President Zelensky has been critical at times of, of some of the European countries that he believed weren't doing enough to, to help Ukraine. Um, was his tone in, in his address during this tour different? Was it more diplomatic? Was he trying to show his appreciation more this time around? Yeah, that was completely different. Uh, I mean, the tone was, was more diplomatic, but at the same time, I would say it was more strategic. But probably because he uh, has perceived that this, this meeting was not going to be uh, symbolic, uh, only symbolic, because it was uh, US being very much symbolic, too much symbolic until now. So things are that definitely going to be, to be different. Uh, it is true that there were some uh, some countries, some European countries, uh, EU members that in the past have demonstrated to be not so much supportive as the others uh, in respect to to the to Ukraine. Uh, but at the same time, what we saw during this meeting was a, a more uh, uh, let's say comprehensive approach toward Ukraine. Obviously, some countries, I don't know, like Hungary, for example, didn't demonstrate uh, a complete, uh, complete new uh, uh, approach. Uh, but in some way, with mm. ways, it was a little bit uh, more dramatic uh, because Zelensky was here for uh, expecting a bit more. 
and probably it was uh, it was using a more strategic mm. approach, cautious approach, than a strategic one as well. Hmm. Uh, um, Serhi, uh, we only have a couple of minutes left. Uh, I want to ask you, when it comes to President Zelensky trying to ensure that Ukraine can join the EU, um, do you think that Ukraine will be able to join the EU in an expedited manner? And, and also, more importantly, what can EU membership offer Ukraine? The EU membership uh, is a um, long-term advantage for Ukraine. Uh, it will allow Ukraine uh, to restore after the uh, after all the devastations uh, made uh, by Russia, and um, this was uh, this will also help to make our country better, uh, because in order to become um, an EU member state, Ukraine uh, needs to make reforms or otherwise Ukraine doesn't become EU member state. And um, such reforms, uh, they will not allow such things like corruption or mismanagement that uh, were widespread in Ukraine before. Uh, I think that uh, the EU membership will allow us to become better internally. And uh, um, in future, we will uh, Leave without such um, such such things that, like corruption that ruined us, and because of corruption, the money are spent ineffective in an and ineffective Sarah, way. Sarah, Sarah, I'm the, sorry to interrupt you again. Yeah. We're just almost out of time. Just very quickly, do you think that the EU will allow Ukraine to join anytime soon? Just very quickly, please. It will not happen until the war ends, I suppose. And uh, I think it can take up to five or seven years uh, when such reforms that are needed for Ukraine to join EU, mm. uh, it, will it will make uh, this possible. All right. Uh, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Serhi Shapovalov, Daniela Herrera, and Samuel Green. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jumjum, and the whole team here, bye for now.